Hello, I am Taiza here, a National Director of Lung Cancer Education, and I'll be moderating our session today. Welcome everyone to today's Lung Cancer Patient Meetup on the Go webinar on lung cancer scans, CT, PET, and MRIs. All you need to know. I would like to acknowledge our sponsor, Cleveland Clinic Florida, for supporting lung cancer education programs like our current session today. Today's session will feature Dr. Ian Drexler from the Cleveland Clinic. He will discuss the different types of lung cancer scans, when they are used, the role of scans and staging, and how doctors can determine uh, if you have lung cancer with the results. Dr. Drexler is a cardiothoracic radiologist at Cleveland Clinic Florida's Weston Hospital. He completed his fellowship in cardiothoracic imaging at New York Presbyterian Hospital Wheel Cornell Medical Center, where he also completed his combined radiology res residency training with Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. He obtained his medical degree from college from the College of Physicians at Surgeons at Columbia University, where he also received his MBA and BA in economics. Dr. Drexler is a member of the Society of Thoracic Radiology, North American Society for Cardiovascular Imaging, American College of Radiology, and American Rowan Ray Society. He has multiple peer-reviewed publications, including on topics in cardiothoracic imaging. He is active in teaching of uh, medical students and involved in quality and patient safety efforts at the Cleveland Clinic Florida. As we begin, please note that participants will be on mute. Participants may ask questions in the chat feature of the webinar platform. Uh, we will have a brief question and answer session at the end of uh, the session after Dr. Drexler's presentation. At this time, it is our honor and privilege to have Dr. Drexler speak. Dr. Drexler, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I'm Dr. Ian Drexler. I'm a cardiothoracic radiologist at the Lang Family Department of Imaging in Cleveland Clinic Weston Hospital, which is about 20 minutes west of Fort Lauderdale in the greater Miami metropolitan area. It is really a privilege to be here speaking with you today on lung cancer scans. The first question I wanna answer and the first thing I wanna talk about is what is a radiologist? Because a lot of people actually don't know what we do. A radiologist is a medical doctor and we are trained to read or interpret diagnostic imaging, including X-rays or radiographs, CTs, MRIs, and PET scans. Typically, we'll have at least 10 years of education and training from medical school into residency and fellowship. And we work closely with our colleagues in oncology, pathology, thoracic surgery, and radiation oncology in treating lung cancer patients. With that, I'll begin with an introduction to my talk. So why are we here today? Why do we talk about lung cancer and imaging? This graph shows that lung cancer is the third most common cause of cancer in the United States. And what this is showing based off National Cancer Institute data from 2021 is the number of estimated cancers to be diagnosed in the United States each year. At number one is breast cancer with about 280,000 cases. Prostate cancer is number two with about a quarter million. And then a close third is lung cancer with about 235 cases diagnosed each year. Now, in spite of the fact that lung cancer is the third most common diagnosed cancer each year, it is by far the leading cause of cancer death. From the same National Cancer Institute data, we see that lung cancer deaths deaths are as many as the next three most common causes of cancer deaths combined, the next three being colon, pancreatic, and breast, and that in a given year, they're estimated to be about 130,000 deaths due to lung cancer, whereas number two, for example, colon cancer is closer to 50,000 deaths. And this is why it's so important, and this is why we're talking about this. So types of lung cancer. If you're diagnosed with lung cancer, typically you'll receive the biopsy and a pathologist who is a doctor who is trained to look at cells under the microscope will be able to say what type of cancer you have. The most common by far 
is called non-small cell lung cancer, representing about 80 to 85% of all diagnosed lung cancers. And within non-small cell lung cancer, there are different types of cancers, including adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, large cell carcinoma, at 10 to 15% of diagnosed cancers, there is small cell lung cancer, and then carcinoid tumors account for less than 5% of diagnosed cancers. There are some rare types of cancer that can also come up, including lymphomas and sarcomas. In terms of major lung cancer risk factors, I think most people are aware that cigarette smoking is by far the number one risk factor for developing lung cancer. In addition, secondhand smoking exposure has been shown to increase your risk of lung cancer, as well as inhaling other carcinogens, including asbestos, uranium, or radon. Of course, there are other known lung cancer risk factors, for example, in some areas where there's a lot of pollution, uh, for example, there may be a higher risk of lung cancer due to inhaling that pollution. And there are some lung cancers, for example, that may be associated with certain genetics. Staging. So staging is the process by which we determine how much lung cancer there is in the body, where it has spread, and to what extent it has spread or metastasized. There's something called a clinical stage, which is based on a combination of physical examination, biopsy or tissue sampling results, and imaging, which I will discuss more at length in this talk. There's also a pathologic stage, also called a surgical stage, that is based on tissue removed during a surgery. And why is staging so important? It's because staging affects your treatment options and your survival. So how does staging work? The most common way that we classify stage is by TNM staging, where TNM stands for tumor nodes metastasis. T or tumor is primarily based on the size of the primary tumor, as well as additional factors, including growth of the tumor into adjacent structures. N or nodes is determined by whether cancer has spread into adjacent lymph nodes. And a lymph node is an organ, there are many throughout the body that is part of your immune system that helps fight off, for example, disease and infection and cancer can spread along the lymphatic channels that drain and move around the, the lymph fluid to the lymph nodes. And M for metastasis. This is cancer that has spread to distant organs. So this is a picture of the chest. And just to orient you, on each side in this uh, pink is an image of a lung and in the center we have the heart, and this blue tubular structure would be the airway or trachea. So when determining T, the first thing we look at is how big is the tumor? Is it one, two, seven or more centimeters in size? And as it gets bigger, the, you get a higher T, starting at T1 going to T4. There are other factors that can determine a higher T, for example, if there are additional lung nodules that have spread in the same lung, or if the tumor itself has directly extended into the airways that go to the, your main airway or trachea, or if, for example, the tumor has directly extended into the chest wall or the pleura, which is the lining of your lungs. Talking about N, Here in the center of this picture with the letter T is the primary tumor. If the tumor or metastasizes or really spreads to lymph nodes that are in the chest, you get either N1, N2, or N3 disease. So the further away it spreads to the lymph nodes in the chest, the higher the N is. And then finally, distant metastasis. If, for example, the tumor has spread and there are malignant cells within the pleural space that lines along. That is an example of metastatic spread. 
if it goes to other organs throughout the body, for example, your brain, liver, or bone, that is another example of distant metastasis. And so once we have all this information together, that determines staging, starting with stage one, going to stage four. And you see for the first few stages at the beginning, one and some of two, really we're just talking about tumor size. At this point, it is not spread to lymph nodes and it is not spread to distant parts of the body. As the stage increases, that's typically because the primary tumor has either gotten to a certain size or it has spread to lymph nodes in the chest. And then stage four cancer is when the cancer has spread or metastasized to distant parts of the body. And why, again, is this so important? Why do we do this staging? One, it determines the treatment options. For example, if you have an early stage cancer that might be more amenable to surgery or radiation treatment, but if you have a later stage cancer that is spread, for example, to the bones, you may need a more systemic therapy throughout the body, such as in the form of chemotherapy or immunotherapy. In addition to treatment, the stage can give you a prognosis of survival rates. Now, I want to start with the caveat that this is data from the American Cancer Society in 2017. And through research and innovation, honestly, every year, every month, every day, we're finding new treatments, new therapies for lung cancer. And these numbers, I would imagine, are higher now than they even were in 2017. That being said, the trend is still the same. As you go within a stage from A1 to B, or as you go from a stage one to stage two to stage three to four, your long-term survival rate, and in this case is a five-year survival rate, decreases. Lung cancer staging and follow-up. So I'm gonna give you a staging example based on what we just discussed about how as a radiologist, I will help the oncologist or a th thoracic surgeon stage a cancer. And just to orient everyone, and I'll be discussing about each of these a little more in detail later. On the left here, we have a chest x-ray or chest radiograph. And just to make sure we all know what we're talking about, if we look on both sides here, where we have black, that is the lung. The little white lines going through the lung are your vessels that supply and drain blood to the lung. In the center, we have this rounded object that is your heart. And then the very white parts are going to be bones. So you'll have ribs. In the center, we have our spine or backbone. And when radiologists look at imaging, left is right and right is left. So if you ever read a report and look at your images, and we're talking about something on this side, which to us is our left-hand side, but we say it's in the right lung. The reason is because when we look at images, things are flipped. So this is an X-ray that was obtained for a patient who was having chest pain. And the radiologist noted that there was an opacity for this white round object in the lung that shouldn't be there and recommended a chest CT. And here is the image from the chest CT showing better that object that turned out to be a cancer. So the patient for a workup of the cancer had a PET CT. And this PET CT shows that this lesion is here and it's very bright, meaning it's, it's taking up a lot of glucose, which we'll talk about a little later, but it is confirming that this is the cancer and that this is uh, hypermetabolic, which means it's very active because cancers take up a lot of glucose. And in terms of staging, looking at the T stage, we're able to measure it. So we know that the cancer is 6.2 centimeters, which makes it a T3. Looking for lymph nodes in the chest, we see that it has spread to lymph nodes in what's called the mediastinum, which is the structures that surround the heart, making it an N2. And in this case, there were no distant metastases. So putting that all together, we have a T3, N2, M0 cancer, making it a stage 3B cancer. And based on that, based on this 2017 data, we know that the five-year survival rate for stage 3B is 26%. 
So let's talk about lung cancer detection on imaging. How is lung cancer found? There are typically three ways that we find lung cancer. One is incidentally or by chance on imaging exams are performed for unrelated reasons. One is through annual low dose lung cancer screening chest CTs, which I'll discuss a little more in depth in the next slide. And also during workup of symptomatic patients, for example, if someone comes in with a persistent cough or shortness of breath. And I just want to reiterate that although these are, are very nonspecific and do not necessarily mean you have cancer, any symptoms that you do have, especially persistent symptoms, should be brought to the attention of your physician to see if any further investigation is needed. So I want to talk briefly about low dose lung cancer screening chest CTs, which it's not necessarily the topic of this uh, presentation. It's just so important that I wanted to talk a little more about it. The US Preventive Task Force Services, which provides recommendations on various screening tests in this country, recommends annual low dose lung cancer screening with low dose chest CT in adults who are ages 50 to 80 years, have at least a 20 pack year smoking history, where one pack year means that you smoke one pack of cigarettes every day for an entire year, and who are either current smokers or have quit within the past 15 years. And, and why is this important? It's because these screening CTs have actually been shown to reduce lung cancer deaths. And part of the reason is that lung cancer often is not going to be symptomatic until much later when it's more difficult to treat. You can imagine that if you have a very tiny nodule, as tiny, for example, as a sign, as a size of a grain of rice, they may not cause someone's symptoms. But if you get that low dose lung cancer screening chest CT before you're symptomatic and find it when it's that tiny and when it's that early on in a stage, is more readily treatable and your long term survival is much greater. So this is an example of an incidental lung cancer found on a chest X-ray. This is a patient who was having a colonoscopy and the anesthesiologist asked for a pre-procedural chest X-ray. And the radiologist noted there was a subtle round white object in the lung that shouldn't be there that they called a lung nodule and they recommended a chest CT. And this chest CT, we can see much more clearly that there is a nodule in the lung which ended up being a lung cancer that was found by chance in an asymptomatic patient. This is an example of what a low dose lung cancer screening chest CT looks like. Even though it's a much lower dose than a regular chest CT, about a fifth of the normal dose, you can see lung nodules very well. And this is another asymptomatic patient who because the patient had a smoking history that made them eligible for low dose lung cancer screening, they received the CT and they were able to find this lung cancer early when it was very easily treatable. And then the last example is a patient had shortness of breath and went to their doctor for persistent shortness of breath. The doctor ordered an X-ray, which is typically one of the first type of imaging exams that will be ordered because it's cheap and readily available. And they found that there was an abnormality in the right lung. And a CT showed that there was a large lung cancer and some fluid surrounding the lung that likely caused the shortness of breath. And this patient was subsequently treated. So I'm going to go and talk one by one about what to expect and what the uses are in workup and staging of cancer with chest X-rays, CTs, MRs, and PETs, starting with chest X-rays or radiographs. So chest X-rays, they really aren't the best screen examination, and I'll show you why in the next couple of slides. That being said, as I've already shown you, they may pick up lung cancers incidentally at various stages. They are often the initial exam for symptomatic patients because they're readily available. They're in a lot of hospitals and doctor's offices, and they're also not as expensive as other exams, for example, CTs or MRIs. That being said, once a cancer is diagnosed, they're really of limited value in the workup and particularly the staging of lung cancer. What to expect? If you've ever had a chest X-ray, it's a very fast image acquisition. You're usually standing up while the X-ray is being acquired. That being said, if you have difficulty standing up, if you're in a wheelchair, you can still have a chest X-ray obtained. You'll be asked to hold your breath for a couple of seconds while the X-ray is being uh, acquired. And I'm going to talk here a little bit about radiation. 
all of these exams, with the exception of MRI, that means X-rays, CTs, PET CTs, they all use ionizing radiation. And there is a theoretical risk of developing cancer by receiving radiation. Now, everyone receives radiation uh, from background throughout the year. There's radiation that comes from outer space. There's radiation that comes from elements in the Earth. And in the United States, the um, medical industry maybe contributes about half of the radiation dose that the average American receives, the other half coming from this background radiation. And again, when we think about the radiation risk from an X-ray, it's, it's a tiny amount of radiation. And typically, any effects that you might have from radiation uh, are more likely to happen if you receive radiation, for example, as a child rather than as an adult. And typically, when we're talking about lung cancer, this is something that's affecting adults, typically older adults. And we believe that any theoretical risk of developing a cancer as a result of CTs or PET CTs are much lower than the benefit that you actually obtain by diagnosing and following and treating a cancer. This is an example of a typical X-ray machine. Again, typically a chest X-ray, you'll be standing up, you'll be holding onto some bars. It'll take less than five seconds to acquire. Typically you get two images and you should be in and out pretty quickly. And this is why we don't love chest X-rays for detecting or following cancers. This is actually a study done back in the 1980s where they want to see if they can screen for cancer with chest X-ray. And you'll see here on the far right, there's this kind of ovoid, hazy white round object, which ended up being a lung cancer. And this patient received chest X-rays every year for several years. And you notice as you go back that this little nodule or round spot was smaller and smaller. And it wasn't actually detected until the image on the far right, because there's a lot going on in these X-rays. There, there's vessels and other spots that you see. And so a radiologist interpreting this wouldn't necessarily think that there's anything abnormal by this spot, which may be no different than any other spot in the lung until it gets to a certain size. That being said, as I've shown you, we can find lung cancers on X-ray. So there is some value to obtaining it, even as a first line imaging test. <laughs> Next, I'll discuss CT. What is a CT scan? CT stands for computed tomography. It's also known as a CAT scan, and it uses multiple X-rays to create images that are constructed as slices throughout the body. It provides excellent anatomic detail showing you parts of the lung as well as other parts of the body. And it's used to stage lung cancer as well as to follow both during and after treatment. CT of the chest is actually the most common method to follow lung cancer treatments. And people may also need CT of other body parts, for example, your abdomen and your pelvis to assess whether cancer has spread into the belly. And CT of the spine or brain may also be used depending on patient symptoms. Though, as I'll discuss, for these body parts, MR is actually typically better. What is a CT exam like? It's again relatively quick, not as quick as an X-ray, but it should take less than one minute of actual scanning, typically about 10 to 20 seconds, in fact. Now, you may or may not have an IV or a needle placed to uh, inject with contrast, or dye, as some people may know it as, the most common type being called Omnipig. And you may or may not be asked to drink oral contrast, which is typically more reserved for patients who have CTs at the belly. Again, you'll be asked to hold your breath during the duration of the scan. It shouldn't be more than 10 to 20 seconds, but you can imagine just like if you're taking a photograph of someone and they're moving, things are blurry uh, when, when that happens. So you wanna try to hold still. And again, you'll be laying flat on a table, which I'll, I'll show an image of in two slides. What are the risks? Again, there's this risk of a lifetime risk of developing an additional cancer by having that little bit of radiation, uh, though again, in adults, particularly older adults, this really isn't something that we concern ourselves about. If you are receiving contrast or dye, there is a small risk that you can have a, a reaction 
allergic reaction to the dye, just as this, you might have an allergic reaction to other medication or food. Typically, if this does happen, which is rare, it is usually very mild and self-limited. Perhaps you might have some rash or some itching, and typically within 30 minutes, it goes away on its own. But it is something they have to consider. And this is what a CT scanner looks like. We have a long table that you'll typically lay flat on your back, and then there is this donut where the x-rays are produced and the images are captured. And as the CT scanner scans, the table moves quickly through the donut, acquiring images of the body. And this is an example of what images look like from a CT scanner. On the left here, this is what typically radiologists will look like. To imagine what we're looking at, think about the old uh, magician's trick where the magician asks their assistant to come up to the stage and you put the assistant in a box and saw them in half. If they were actually doing that, when you open them up, this is what you would look at. It, it looks like they potentially have a slice of your body. On the right is just making a slice in a different way as if they sliced you while you were standing, for example. So this image shows what we call a nodule in this patient's right lung. It's this small little white circle. And this is an early lung cancer that was detected. And again, this is something before the patient would likely be symptomatic and likely also before it could be detected on chest X-ray. And that is why CT is such a powerful tool for detecting and following lung cancer. In addition, CT can show very well the spread of lung cancer to lymph nodes and to other organs. This CT shows an example of spread of cancer or metastasis to the bone. Here we have the backbone or what are called the thoracic vertebral bodies, and normally they're dark on this image, but you can see here at the bottom that it's very white, and this white is an example of the bone metastasis that the radiologist was able to detect with CT. We also use CT to follow lung cancer. On the left here, we have an example of this round white nodule on the patient's left lung, and the patient was treated with surgery, so it was removed in the operating room, and we're able to follow the CT but with CT, and we see on the follow-up that the round nodule is no longer there, and that there's no evidence of any disease left. There's just a little bit of scarring the patient had from, from the surgery. This is another example of a patient with lung cancer. We see in this patient on this chest CT, this patient had this round nodular mass in their left lung. And instead of surgery, in this case, this patient was treated with radiation therapy and chemotherapy. And we can see on follow-up, that this large nodule essentially has melted away and there's just some scarring left over. So these are both cases in which we're able to follow lung cancers and, and see that they've gone away with treatment. Next, I will discuss MRI. MRI stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. And unlike CT and X-ray, MRI uses magnets and radio frequency waves to create images. Now, MRI is typically the best exam to look for a spread or metastases to the brain, and is also excellent at looking at spread into the spine or backbone. MRI may also be used to evaluate potential metastases in other bones and certain organs, for example, in the liver or adrenal glands. Now, a lot of people wonder, you know, if I don't get exposed to radiation from MRI, why can't I be screened with a chest MRI? Or why can't we use chest MRI to follow my lung cancer? And the reason is that it really poorly assesses the lungs. You wouldn't be able to see a very small nodule on a chest MRI as well as you would with a CT. So it's really not a, a great examination. Though it is good for certain purposes in the chest, for example, to assess for spread of cancer to the bones or to the chest wall, or for invasion or metastatic spread to structures such as the heart and the surrounding area called the mediastinum. What is an MRI scan like? Unlike the X-ray and CT, there's a lot more time involved. They typically take about 30 to 60 minutes of scan time. 
and patients are most often given contrast through an IV or needle into their arm called gadolinium to help aid with detection of malignancy. Now the MRI scanner is very loud. If you haven't been in one, it almost sounds like someone is either banging on the machine and you might hear some loud clicking noises. And so typically you'll be given some earplugs or headphones to help with that noise. And with MRI, just like most imaging studies, it's very important to hold still for long periods. You, you may or may not be asked to hold your breath for a short amount of time, but the most important thing is that you're not moving your body around. Are there risks to the MRI? The biggest problem is that you're in a very strong, large magnet. So when you're giving your when you're having an MRI, you're often asked to remove your clothing and to wear a hospital gown, robe, or socks. You should not put any jewelry on when you're going to get the MRI. In fact, it's best to leave it at home so you don't lose it. And for those of you who have implantable devices, for example, coronary stents, joint replacements, or other hardware, most of these are MRI safe, though there are some that are not. So before the MRI, either your doctor or the technologist are gonna ask you questions about what is implanted in your body to make sure that you are safe to have the MRI. And even with devices that are safe, there is a small theoretical risk that devices can, for example, heat up, or maybe if you have an electronic device inside of you that could reset, but these are monitored very closely during the scan. This is what the MR scanner looks like. It looks pretty similar to the CT scanner, but you'll notice that the donut is much bigger and the hole in the donut is a little smaller than the CT. But again, it's a, it's a flat table that you're laying on as the images are being acquired. This is an MRI of the brain. And if we look within this dotted yellow circle, there is another circle, which is a, a little black circle with a surrounding white, and this is exactly what a metastasis looks like. So this is someone with lung cancer that has spread or metastasized to the brain. They were able to detect with the brain MRI. This is an MRI of someone's thoracic spine or their backbone. And the normal areas of bone are dark, but these very bright or white areas are the abnormal bone that show metastases from this patient's lung cancer. As mentioned, MRI may also aid in the detection of spread or metastases to other organs, for example, the liver. If we look at this image on the left and to orient everyone, on the left side of the image is the patient's liver. This here in the center is the patient's stomach, and on the right-hand side of the screen is the patient's spleen. And this radiologist who was reading this noted that there are these subtle white circles in the liver, and to better evaluate it, they suggested to get an MRI. And this is the MRI, and, and you can see that not only can you see these white nodules much more clearly on the MRI, but you can actually see other ones that you couldn't see in the CT on the MRI. And these ended up representing metastases from this patient's lung cancer. Next, I will discuss PET imaging for staging and follow-up of lung cancer. What is PET? PET stands for positron emission tomography. So unlike X-rays or CTs, where the X-ray is coming at you from a machine, in this case, you are actually injected with a radioactive drug or radio tracer called FDG through a little IV that typically goes into the arm. And this FDG has a structure that is actually similar to glucose or sugar. And why do we use this? So glucose or sugar is taken up by tumor cells at a much faster rate than it is taken up by normal cells in the body. So when you scan the patient after they are given this FDG, the tumor cells become bright or what we say hot on PET scans. And if you read your reports, you might see something that says that something is FTG avid or hypermetabolic. Other things, however, like infection can also be bright or hot on PET. So it's important to note that just because you have something in your lung 
that does look broad on PET, that it does not mean that it's 100% going to be a lung cancer. It could also, for example, be an infection, such as a pneumonia. So what to expect with a PET scan? Most PET scans are combined with a low-dose CT. You will be asked to be in a certain diet for about 24 hours prior to the scan. Typically, this is a low carbohydrate diet. And you'll also often be asked not to have anything except for water for about six hours prior to the scan. You'll probably receive other instructions, for example, not to engage in strenuous exercise for 24 hours prior to the exam. And again, the reason for all of this is because we're giving you uh, something that mimics glucose. And if you're exercising, for example, we know that muscles require glucose. So when the radio tracer or FDG is injected, we don't want it to go to the muscles that you've been using. We want it to find the cancer cells. So as mentioned, you will be injected through the IV with this radio tracer. Now, even though you have this radioactive element in your bloodstream, which will quickly leave in the urine, you'll, so you'll essentially pee it out within a few hours, you will not perceive anything abnormal about you. After the injection, you'll wait about 60 minutes, and it will take about 30 to 60 minutes to actually do the scanning. As usual, you must remain still during the image acquisition, but you will be able to freely breathe since this will be about a 30 to 60 minute scan. And I didn't include a picture of the PET scanner, but it looks very similar to a CT scanner. Again, with PET scans, there is additional radiation involved. And again, we strongly feel that this low theoretical risk of cancer from imaging is far away by the benefits of actually following and detecting cancer. So on the left, we have a CT scan that showed a lung nodule on a patient. And this is someone who was a smoker. If we look closely, and it may not project well on, depending on your screen, these very dark black areas around the lung are actually emphysema, which is destruction of the lung that you get when you have been smoking. And a PET scan was recommended to evaluate this nodule. And on the right here, we see that it's very orange, almost looks like the sun. And that shows that it is taking up a lot of that glucose or FTG because it's very active. And this did end up being a lung cancer. This is how PET-CT is shown, is used to show response to a lung cancer after treatment. On the left here, we have the initial staging PET-CT. In this patient's left lung, we have a large lung cancer that is very bright, very orange. And we also see that when we look at the lymph nodes that are in the mediastinum, which is again the area that surrounds the heart, that we have a lymph node here that is a little bright. So this is someone who had lung cancer and an N2 uh, lymph node. A year after treatment, this patient had a PET-CT, and we can see that the cancer in the left lung is completely gone and that the lymph node is no longer bright. So this is a successful treatment of a lung cancer shown by PET. So before I ended, I wanted to actually talk about cost and insurance. And this is probably something I could spend an entire hour about talking in and of itself. In general, x-rays are cheaper than CT scans, which are cheaper than MRI and PET. Not to say that x-rays are cheap, but they are considerably cheaper than the other types of imaging. Now, you may have heard the terms copay and deductible. And depending on the insurance, every time you go either to see your doctor in the office for a checkup, or perhaps every time you get a CAT scan, you may have to pay a set amount of money, let's say $50 for each scan that you get. And so that would be a copay. A deductible is different. In some insurance plans, every year the clock resets and before the insurance kicks in, you have to pay a certain amount of money out of pocket. So let's say, for example, you have to spend $500 out of pocket before insurance kicks in. That would be a $500 deductible. 
The other thing you may have heard of is prior authorization or pre-authorization. So for certain advanced imaging, particularly CT, MRI, and PET scans, you may need to get permission from the insurance company. And so this may involve the insurance company talking directly with your doctor and ensuring that this is the best test. For example, if you get a chest X-ray that shows a nodule, rather than jumping straight to PET-CT, the insurance company might say, wait a second, we should probably get a CT scan first to make sure that what we're seeing on the X-ray is truly a nodule, for example, before we move on and get a much more uh, advanced and more expensive exam uh, in the form of a PET. So with that, I just have some brief concluding remarks. One, that CT and PET-CT are the main ways to work up and stage lung cancer. Two, that MRI is useful for certain body parts, especially in the brain. Three, that chest X-rays are really of limited value in following lung cancer. And four, lung cancer screening chest CTs save lives. I thank you all for coming out today and taking the time to listen, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you so thank much, you Dr. Drexler, for an informative session. And um, we had quite a few questions that came in from the registration. Uh, participants can also ask questions in the chat. Um, we'll try to get to all the questions, uh, but if we run out of time, we'll follow up with uh, answers over email. Um, it does look like somebody has their hand risen. Uh, they might have to write their question in the chat, but um, for now we can move on to questions uh, that came through the registration, uh, so we can get started there. Uh, the first question uh, is, what are stages of lung cancer? Stage one, two, three, and four. And the second part of the question is, uh, stage four lung cancer, is not a death, death, uh, death sentence, is it? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so this is something that I, I did touch upon uh, in the talk. I'll go back to the earlier slide. And in terms of staging, it, it has to do with, again, the size of the tumor, whether it has spread to lymph nodes in the chest, and then whether it has spread or metastasized to more distant lymph nodes. And the bigger the tumor, the further it has spread in the chest lymph nodes, and whether or not it has spread outside of the chest to distant organs such as the brain or the spine or the liver determines the stage. And as we showed you, again, this is 2017 data, the higher the stage of the cancer, the lower the survival is in the long term. Now, again, We've made many advances in medicine the past several years, specifically with immunotherapy. And no, stage four is not, quote, a death sentence. That being said, it's important you know, to stay vigilant and to follow up with your physician and really see what options are out there so you're able to really be your best advocate and have the highest chances of survival. Thank you, Dr. Drexler, for that answer. Um, the next question that came in from the registration was uh, April 26, 2021, had a middle lobe of uh, right lung cancer removed, two clear CT scans since surgery. Other than prey, how do I stay cancer free? Um, thank you for that question. Well, first of all, congratulations on being cancer free for those clear CT scans. And you know, this is a hard question, and it really um, is about staying healthy in general, aside from making sure that you're following up with your doctors and getting the scans that you're needed, you really wanna be healthy. So that means not smoking. If you are a smoker, quitting. If you're not a smoker, abstaining from cigarette use. It's about exercising and about eating healthy. And really that's you know the most important thing just to stay healthy in general. Perfect. Uh, we have a couple of questions coming in from the chat. Actually, we can take those now. Uh, let's see here. Okay, here we go. 
Robin is asking, what's the difference between non-small cell lung cancer and small cell lung cancer? And uh, what about the bone scans? Okay, now those are great questions. So as I mentioned, when you get, uh, if someone gets diagnosed with cancer, typically you'll have had a piece of tissue sampled and a pathologist will look at it under a microscope. And it, the, the simplest answer is that the non-small cell lung cancers under the microscope look bigger than the small cell lung cancers, uh, though they will behave differently. And for example, small cell lung cancer is almost exclusively seen in people who have a history of smoking uh, tobacco, whereas non-small cell lung cancer, uh, the correlation is not as strong. And they'll behave differently and they'll be receptive to different treatments. For example, small cell lung cancer is more likely to spread or metastasize to the brain. Uh, so again, the type of lung cancer you have, you have uh, will really dictate uh, your treatment options, for example. And then bone scans. So bone scans are a, a type of uh, molecular imaging or nuclear scan where you're injected with a radio tracer similar to um, with the PET-CT that we spoke about. But in this case, this radio tracer goes to the bones. And just like FDG likes to go to tumor because it is growing and taking a lot of glucose, the tracer injected in the bone scan uh, likes to go to bone cancers that are building bone faster. So some types of bone metastases uh, from lung cancer will actually build bone. Actually, in the example that I showed you uh, of the CT showing the metastases to the, the backbone or the spine, which is here, we can see that it's very dense and it's dense because it's essentially building bone. So in a bone scan, we'll be able to detect, detect this because it'll appear hot or bright in the bone scan because this lesion right here is taking up that tracer that was injected faster than the normal adjacent bone. And so bone scan does play a very important role because bone scan, uh, depending on the situation, may be able to detect spread to bones that could be missed uh, on CT, for example, if something is, is very small or subtle. So I, I hope that answers your question. A yeah, very good explanation there. Um, a similar question followed up after that. Um, I think you may have answered it, but um, if you have any extra comments to this, uh, when is a bone scan used and why would it be used instead of a PT, PET? Yeah, so, so PET scan is really a scan of your whole body looking for tumor anywhere. So tumor in the lungs, uh, cancer that is spread to the lymph nodes, to other organs in your belly, for example, your liver or your adrenal glands, as well as to your bones. So the bone scan is very specific, looking at spread of cancer only to the bones, whereas PET scan will look at spread of cancer elsewhere. Uh, one or, or the other may be used depending on your symptoms or your stage, and they may also be used in conjunction together. Thank you for that, yeah. Um, Jane also asks, um, I used to drink oral uh, contrast for ABCTs, uh, but they stopped doing it. Does this give the same ability to determine metastasis? Yeah, so, so oral contrast um, you know, there is some debate about how useful it is, and, and this is contrast that you drink, and it, it goes throughout the bowel, and it makes the inside of the bowel look very bright. And in, in terms of looking for spread of lung cancer, it doesn't really add much of value. When we think of spread of lung cancer, we think of it going to bones, uh, to lymph nodes in the abdomen. It could go to the liver, to the adrenal glands, and whether or not you have oral contrast, it, it it won't affect uh, the ability to detect spread to these organs. Uh, what may be more important when you have the scan of the abdomen is the intravenous contrast, because uh, that can help uh, highlight spread of cancer to certain areas uh, much better than if you did not have contrast. So I think the IV contrast is, is much more important than the oral contrast. So I, I wouldn't be too worried about not having oral contrast. Thank you, Dr. Drexler. Um, another question that seems to keep coming up as a theme. Um, th what is the frequency of scans post-surgery and what's the makeup uh, is it C between CT, PT, uh, and x-rays? So this is really uh, 
not an easy question to answer because the answer is it depends. It depends on the stage of the cancer. It depends on the type of cancer. It depends on how your body has responded to the cancer treatment. As I mentioned, typically it won't be followed with x-rays and depending on your staging, it may be followed by CTs, PET CTs or a combination thereof. Uh, depending on the treatment you're receiving or maybe if you're on for example, an experimental treatment, there may actually be very specific protocols that your oncologist or cancer doctor follows uh, that says, let's say at three months you get a CT and then three months or six months later you get another CT. Uh, in general, for the first couple of years, again, depending on the cancer, you may get imaging every three or six months. And then as you've been cancer free longer and longer, uh, it may spread out to longer intervals. And then in most cancers, uh, after five years, they won't scan quite so frequently. And, and that's really more of a discussion with the oncologist for what to do after that time point. Some people, for example, will do annual uh, chest CTs uh, after the five year mark, as long as you've been cancer free. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, so the next question on our list of um, Q and A are, um, is coming from Rebecca. Uh, are there specific indicators showing that lung is the primary um, cause or not the metastases? Yeah, so I, I think what the question is, you know, if you have a lung nodule, how do you know that it formed in the lung as opposed to maybe elsewhere, let's say in the colon that spread? And when the doctor samples the tissue, there are certain markers that are expressed in lung cancers that won't be expressed in other types of cancers. And the pathologist will use these stains uh, to look for these markers. And that helps the pathologist determine, oh, this most likely came from the lung, or it looks like maybe this came from somewhere else. Perfect. Thank you for that. Uh, let's move on. There is a question that's general. I believe uh, we touched on it a bit. Um, throughout the presentation, but let's see if there's any extra comments. Um, in this, in which situation do we need PET, CT, and uh, CT chest at the same time? Yeah, again, um, you often don't need them at the same time. And the main reason for that is that when you get a PET CT, you also get a low dose CT with the PET. So if you get a CT, you know, it's very good at detecting lung cancer and spread. That being said, uh, for example, if you have a, a very small lymph node, which normally, you know, everyone has lymph nodes in their in their body throughout, and we on chest when we're looking at a chest CT, we're looking for the size of the lymph node. So once it becomes bigger than let's say a centimeter in its smallest axis or its smallest dimension, we become concerned that maybe a tumor is spread there. That being said it's possible that tumor has spread to a lymph node that is not big. And that's where PET comes in, because PET looks at how much that lymph node is taking in that glucose, that FTG. And it's possible that with PET-CT, you can detect cancer that is spread somewhere that you wouldn't necessarily detect on CT because that lymph node, for example, in this case, hasn't grown yet, even though the cancer is already spread there. And then in terms of it, uh, getting scanned at the same time. Uh, again, there's really limited use for that. Occasionally, maybe you can find something on the low dose CT portion of the PET CT that maybe, for example, doesn't that doesn't look bright in the PET CT. And in that case, you might want to get a full diagnostic chest CT to look at it better on the CT portion. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, another question, are thinner slice CT chest scans beneficial and do they add extra radiation? So in this day and age, most CT scanners acquire images at a very thin slices, like let's say 0 0.625 millimeters under a centimeter. And then when they're sent to the radiologist to be interpreted, uh, they're reconstructed or formatted such that they look thicker. So let's say when I read it, I read them at 2.5 millimeters. And the reason for this primarily is that if you have very thin slices, it would just take too long to look through all the images without adding much benefit. 
So the answer is typically now all CTs are acquired in thin slices, and we're able to actually format the images to enhance, for example, nodule detection and detection of, of cancer spread. And so th there isn't really much additional benefit at looking at the um, very thin slices. And to answer the question, no, it doesn't uh, give you additional radiation because when you get a CT, it is a single acquisition and everything that happens after that one time the images are acquired is all done at a computer called post-processing. Perfect, thank you. Uh, just a couple, just a little bit more time for a few more questions. Uh, we, we probably won't get to all of them, but we'll follow up. Um, one more question is, I had an MRI that indicated brain was okay. I was never told any info about my liver, never had a CT of abdominal or pelvic. Uh, should I, or should I get it? That again, it, it's a bit of a difficult question, uh, you know, for, for me to answer without knowing um, the type of cancer, uh, the stage. Uh, so it sounds like you had a brain MRI that was normal, but it's possible they didn't image your abdomen or, or pelvis. Um, I think this is probably a better question uh, for your oncologist uh, to ask, you know, why it wasn't scanned, whether they think that there is a, a reason to scan the belly. Uh, because if the cancer is localized in the lungs, for example, or regionally in the chest, there may not be a reason to look in the abdomen. So th th that's definitely a good question to ask uh, the oncologist, and that will provide a good uh, conversation to decide what's best. Perfect, thank you. I think uh, it may be time to start the wrap up. Um, Dr. Drexler, if you can advance the closing slides, I will yep. close the meeting out for us. So if you have any additional questions about this webinar or this program, uh, please free, free, feel free to email me directly at timewarrior.zahir at lung.org. Uh, go ahead and to the next slide. Uh, our next session will be on Friday, May 20th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Pacific Time. Um, it'll be on lung cancer surgical intervention options with Dr. Darren Rohan from Northwell Health. Uh, more information can be found at lung.org forward slash patient dash meetup. Uh, next slide there. And uh, so we have a bounty of lung cancer resources on the lung.org website. Uh, you can find general information on lung cancer screening on uh, savebythescan.org. If you haven't already looked into it, we recommend that you try it out uh, and look into that. Uh, we also offer free mentorship programs uh, for lung cancer patients, uh, free online support communities. We also offer lung.org um, the lung.org uh, helpline if you prefer to speak to someone directly. Um, more detailed information on lung cancer education can be found on lung.org forward slash lung dash cancer. Um, and we also provide COVID-19 resources. All of these re resources are shown on this slide here. Um, so we'll have that up for just a split second longer so you can kind of get a screen grab. Um, we will provide all of this information to our registrants following the event along with the recording. Um, and in addition, we'll send feed, we'll send out a feedback form. Your feedback is important to us so that we can continue to improve the program. Um, with this being said, uh, we'll con conclude our program for today. Uh, and thank you all for tuning in and have a great week. Take care. And thank you, Dr. Drexler, for your presentation. Thank you. Bye, all.